All right. So good day, good day everybody. Um, my name is Sergio Caltagirone. I'm Vice President of Threat Intelligence at Dragos. Um, Dragos is a uh, Maryland-based uh, industrial cybersecurity company, um, and we do uh, we um, we are a technology company that uh, has a platform that does um, de threat detection, asset asset identification, and uh, incident response playbooks. Uh, we also have a threat intelligence um, service and a threat operations service that does response um, assessments uh, and support to industrial companies worldwide. And so we do a, um, a wide range of things around the industrial uh, sectors around the world. We have uh, active operations, um, active defense operations going on with companies all around the world constantly. Uh, and so our visibility is quite, uh, quite wide. Um, and so we, you know, for us, it's important. Uh, we, we work to protect critical infrastructure, the lives, uh, businesses and livelihoods of civilians um, all around the world. We, uh, we don't like to draw favorites. We think every civilian life is, um, is worthwhile. So, you know, we try very hard to focus on just protecting the, the critical infrastructure that everyone relies on on a daily basis. So we are, we take this issue very seriously that that's going on right now because obviously as cyber tensions grow, um, we, it is possible that we could see effects against civilian critical infrastructure and that uh, could obviously cause, you know, be a detriment to livelihoods and, and even possibly lives. So uh, our goal is obviously to increase the amount of uh, awareness of this problem, but most importantly, um, we like to use our microphone only to uh, support actual uh, and, impor and important information. So uh, we, as, as many might know, we don't tend to be uh, very uh, escalatory in our rhetoric. Um, about the threats to industrial security, we try to be very realist so that everyone understands what the issue, you know, actually is and take, you know, and can take an actual response to it. Um, so with that, you know, you won't hear things like the world is, you know, world is caving in or everything's on fire or, you know, it's all horrible because it's not. Um, things are still okay, um, you know, but uh, there is cause for concern and we just want people to understand what that is and what they might uh, or should be able to do about it. So joining, um, joining me today is uh, Ben Miller, uh, a friend and vice president of threat operations at Dragos and uh, Casey and Mark, also friends and, and awesome people. Um, and so we're going to uh, talk very much about uh, what's been going on. Uh, but most importantly, while threat intelligence uh, is, a, is a sexy beast uh, and a lot of people love it because it tells a good story and I like being a storyteller, but uh, fundamentally, what we're going to do is try to tell you what the story is, um, but Ben and Mark are really going to dive into what should you do about it, because uh, ultimately that's actually what we're trying to get across here. Is, yeah, things are, you know, things are important, but, um, but really taking action is the most important thing. So we'll first talk about the major issues that are going on right now and the current state of escalating tensions. Uh, we'll talk about um, intelligence on uh, Iranian and Russian associated um, activities. Um, then we'll talk about uh, response and hunting, basically what should we do, uh, what should asset owners and operators do around the world, uh, and you know, detailing specific preparation and response actions uh, that folks should take. So it's, you know, I've been in cybersecurity now for uh, you know, a little over 15 years, um, which isn't as long as some, but longer than others. And it's a, uh, it's been a career of, of mixed blessings. And uh, as many people in cybersecurity know, it, firefighting is part of the job. Um, unfortunately, though, I have not really seen, um, I would say, a situation like we're facing right now around the world. And, and by we, I mean everybody in the world. You know, I'm, I'm including Russian civilians and Iranian civilians here as well, right? Um, which is as civilians, you know, we should be concerned when there is an escalation in military tension um, because it means that we could potentially have uh, significant consequences. So, um, you know, we're seeing two fronts uh, kind of opening up right now. We're seeing a front between the United States and uh, Russia, particularly against uh, the electric utilities and, and those sectors. Um, and then 
the uh, Iranians and, uh, and United States obviously uh, have further escalated into kinetic um, operations. Um, you know, so we, we have seen a very special operations slash traditional kinetic warfare, uh, you know, being conducted. Um, and so there we're seeing, uh, I would say, greater tension, but we can't forget that there's two things happening at the same time, which makes uh, this problem uh, even more complicated uh, and important to recognize. The really, you know, when we talk about um, cyber attack in industrial control, right, we, we talk about offensive, what we call effects operations. And so that's not just getting in, but it's doing something. Getting in is of very little value uh, if you don't actually do something. Um, industrial control systems are really a means to an end. Uh, when you attack an industrial control system, it's not about attacking an industrial control system. It's about attacking um, the business and the lives and the livelihood of those who rely on that industrial control system, realizing that these systems control things like sanitation in our communities, sewer, uh, water management and levees, drinking water, uh, cleanliness and chlorination. Um, you know, we talk about manufacturing plants. Uh, we talk about oil and gas refineries. Um, all things that, that, you know, electric utilities that deliver reliable energy to our homes. So these are all very important areas. Um, and of course, they're also, uh, because they're so important, they're also one of the highest likelihood uh, elements to be attacked um, when things go badly. However, we have to consider uh, one of the biggest questions I get is, well, who are they going to attack and what are they going to do? Um, you know, when you talk about what's the U.S. going to do or what's a Russia going to do or what's a Iran going to do or, or any kind of cyber conflict, I get that question all the time. And the answer is, I wish I had a crystal ball uh, because uh, if I did, I probably would be making more money, you know, doing something else. But I don't. Nobody does. Right. So we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, and, and it's arguable that most of these countries involved don't know what's going to happen. Um, everybody makes plans. Um, but everyone also knows that those plans don't really survive, you know, first contact with the enemy, as, as they say. So uh, I would say that that's what's important about, you know, maintaining a cybersecurity environment, recognizing that plans and preparation are really the most important thing you can do uh, because you just don't have a crystal ball. Um, but what are the potential options here for escalating uh, attacks in industrial control and critical infrastructure? Well, first of all, there's really three elements you have to consider. First is target, right? Do you choose a large target or a small target? Um, those have different, different elements to them, right? Uh, do you want to cause a big effect or a small effect? Are you going more after um, actual damage and harm or are you going to go after more messaging? Also, do you want it to be an in-kind attack or do you, you know, based on some sort of response or retaliation, uh, or do you want to go after something more asymmetric? So, um, you know, that's a, another kind of question that is really kind of up to military planners uh, that, that do these things. Um, and and they, they tend to, uh, you know, understand them. They tend to do lots of planning. Of course, militaries love to plan. Um, but really, the target selection, uh, it happens fairly quickly. Um, in terms of as, as the situation kind of, kind of grows. And then the last question in targeting is where do you target? Do you target uh, in or near the, the country of interest or do you target elsewhere? Um, so, you know, that's, a, that's an, important, an, important recommend, you know, an important consideration in where you target. And those are all options that are available to you. And the next is, of course, effects. Do we directly attack an industrial control system or do we indirectly attack? So, you know, do we actually go after, as we saw a crisis in the Middle East, do we go after the safety systems, um, potentially causing a loss of life event? Or do you simply uh, deploy a wiper, um, you know, or some other so sort of uh, false ransomware attack uh, against an organization's business network to cause some sort of crippling operations outage? You know, those are two different ways of attacking industrial control and critical infrastructure. Uh, both have different outcomes. Um, of course, you know, a, a ransomware attack probably won't cause, you know, most likely uh, won't cause a, a safety issue, right? So you probably won't see a loss of life um, because of ransomware, but it could obviously be an important business and national resource um, that gets disrupted. Uh, and of course, on the other side, you could see direct actual effects, you know, things blowing up, toxic gas releases and loss of life. And of course, the, the, worst, the worst case scenarios we can consider. Lastly is attribution. 
Right? Most military operations, most of them in the world, are attributable. Um, and uh, in fact, we can argue that uh, you know by the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law, uh, military operations uh, almost must be attributable to some extent. Um, but uh, here, right, we also know that that's not always the case. And in cybersecurity and cyberspace, right, we also have the ability to leverage proxies uh, to target proxy victims. Um, and so uh, this is, of course, an oper uh, operational capability and, and option that adversaries have. So just because it's the U.S. and Iran, for instance, in, in tensions and conflict right now, doesn't mean that they're the only two that will be affected um, and that we could see uh, escalations uh, and actual effects caused outside of those, um, those, those two countries. So what are the, the things, the five things that we, we, we've been talking about? The first is take the threat seriously. This is actually a very serious situation. We're seeing two major conflicts and, and tensions rising uh, simultaneously on two different fronts. Um, and of course, that makes it even more complicated. So this is a, a situation that we, we want people to take seriously. Um, the next is think beyond borders. Don't think the idea is I'm not a target. Um, when really in asymmetric cyber warfare, uh, you could very well be a target uh, just because you are, you know, anybody, really. Um, and, and that's a big issue, right? Because sometimes the message is more important than the target. Uh, so just realize, um, just realize just because you don't think you're important doesn't mean others do. Um, increased visibility. The number one issue we have, right, for most industrial control and, and critical infrastructure organizations is that they lack the necessary uh, cybersecurity visibility to one, know if something happened, whether cyber was involved or not. That's the first question that everyone asks. Uh, is cyber involved? And most of the time, these organizations don't have the data necessary to even answer that question. Then the second question, of course, is if it did happen, what happened and what do we do now? So you need visibility. That's the very first thing before you do almost anything. And of course, Threat detection, if you're going to do threat detection, which of course everyone should, relies on visibility. So visibility is your primary responsibility. Um, and then second to that, then we talk about detection and response. And um, we'll go further into what exactly we, we mean here. Um, the next uh, step is, of course, practicing response and recovery. Never walk into a situation uh, with a response plan that has been, uh, you know, unrehearsed, unpracticed, un unrefined. Um, that is the worst mistake possible because you could actually cause the situation to be worse than it really is. Uh, and, that, and that's hard to say because I know people are trying to do their best, um, but also everybody knows that that's the case. Um, that unprepared responders uh, tend to cause more issues than they solve. Um, so that's a, that's a major issue that, that every organization right now needs to do to address. So if you are not practicing and reviewing your response plans, now is a great time to do that. Um, the, generally, the idea here is establish a chain of command. That's super important beforehand. It's something that doesn't require an emergency to do, uh, and it doesn't require a huge bandwidth. Uh, so go ahead and establish a chain of command. Establish the tools and processes you're going to use to do it and practice those. Um, and lastly, have a communications plan, internal and external communications plan um, it, on hand. Who's going to talk? When are you going to talk? Uh, what, are, what, are the, um, uh, what are you going to share? Uh, and what are the boundaries around those? Uh, that's really important. Now, all of this can change, um, right, uh, depending on the situation. But realize that those are the questions you don't want to answer in the midst of a firefight. Uh, and so those are important things that I see most organizations screw up. Um, and it's weird, I say, you know, have a communications plan, you know, if your place is burning down. But I got to tell you, like most of the major cyber situations I've been involved in, what you end up doing as a, as a defender and a responder is you end up spending an inordinate amount of time figuring out who should share what with who, all, you know, and that takes up a whole amount of bandwidth on things that should be spent elsewhere to protect yourself. So what ends up happening is you pull people out of situations to answer that question when they should be spent on actual fighting issues. Um, and which is why I harp on that. It's like, it's an easy thing to do um, and it will save you a lot of effort later. So. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is, is hand it over to Casey uh, Brooks and we're gonna talk about some very specific intelligence on what is actually going on. Uh, and we're a couple of things here. We're not gonna be sharing uh, technical indicators. 
Um, those are being shared right now uh, in, in the cybersecurity community amongst uh, the industries being affected, uh, specific victims and others. Um, so we're not uh, gonna be doing that publicly. We tend not to, to do that as Dragos um, because most of the time indicators tend to be a very poor value and we would prefer defenders focus on the, uh, I'm sorry, indicators are a poor value. We tend to want defenders to focus on behaviors um, and large scale action uh, rather than focusing on, you know, is this IP address in our environment? No, okay, we're probably okay now. And then they tend to forget about a situation. Um, in fact, uh, in most cases, in these types of scenarios, indicators don't drive positive behavior. So uh, we tend not to share those widely uh, for that reason. Uh, of, of course, on specific cases, specific victims, indicators are absolutely valuable for hunting uh, and for response. Uh, but in, in the general case, it's not useful for the, broadest, the broad community. Uh, so with that, we will um, uh, we'll hand it over to Casey now. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, I'm Casey Brooks. I'm a senior adversary hunter here at Dragos. And today we'll be going over uh, some intelligence on Xenotime, Dim Alloy, and Magnalium. Now, when we're looking at these activity groups, we like to focus on, like Sergio said, behaviors. Uh, what differentiates their operations, how they are targeting uh, victims, and ultimately we perform our intelligence analysis to develop a picture of, the, of these activities. Now, uh, Sergio, can you go to the next slide? All right, and when you see headlines like this, um, a lot of it can seem very overwhelming and very uh, scary, I guess. Uh, but there's one of the things to understand, especially with these activity groups, that there's human operators behind them, uh, that they have intent and motivation, they have goals and objectives that they want to accomplish, along with they're also human, they will make mistakes, they will... Uh, establish infrastructure in such a way that makes it very easy or more easy to recognize and track them. And that's what we like to focus on in behavioral aspects is looking at how an actor behaves. And with that, we will uh, go to the next slide and go into Xenotime. So Xenotime is known for the incident that happened in Saudi Arabia in 2017 where a petrochemical refinery was disrupted along with uh, the TRISIS framework. Now, Xenotime continues to be a threat. They continue to perform heavy reconnaissance against targets seeking uh, avenues to enter uh, victim environments. Uh, as of right now, our strategic outlook uh, for Xenotime is one, their expansion to other industry verticals, uh, especially the electric uh, industry vertical, while still maintaining their activity in the oil and gas sector that they have previously conducted. Now, as a operational outlook for them, we look at what exactly they're targeting, how they're going about targeting it. Now, Xenotime has historically really gone after DMZ um, infrastructure, uh, looking to implant web shells, looking to really uh, gain initial access. Uh, and then once in it, takes them a while to become acclimated to their environment, as well as them having to develop specific tools to uh, these environments. Now, as they continue these efforts in compromising IT networks to actually make their way to the OT environments, that's one of the most important things that all of these actor or activity groups that we look at uh, always start at the enterprise zone, if we're referring to the Purdue model. 
And in that, uh, unless they find some low hanging fruit, uh, which is always the case that if they find like an open port into a OT environment that they will most likely take advantage of it. But these all, this be, like includes like an important relationship for, for Uh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> All right. uh, so operational outlook, um, again, they will continue to look for access into your IT environments, uh, especially with uh, performing heavy reconnaissance on information that they can use to perform additional targeting. So they they will heavily scrape your outer perimeter for any open source information that are out there, such as uh, facility locations, geographic locations. They look f heavily for information uh, that pertains to ICS environments. Uh, they also have a penchant for focusing on kind of accessy looking portals. So they will look for vendor access portals. They will look for um, out, open Outlook or open uh, webmail portals. They really like to focus on getting a lay of the outer perimeter and, and how the DMZ is constructed before they uh, start moving into their additional uh, attack phases. Now, most likely case course of action right now is due to recent disclosures uh, on this group, they're most likely going to start ramping down their operations to go quiet, maybe possibly retooling and developing new uh, capabilities. Uh, and again, this is one of the more difficult groups to analyze due to the fact that as we get further from the first incident, as these incidents aren't being reported out or shared or the community isn't being involved in tracking this actor, that it, it'll become increasingly difficult to identify them and that the old information becomes increasingly stale in its use in identifying the actors. So it's really looking for the behaviors where they're focusing on your IT outer perimeter in gathering information, especially if a lot of that information that they gather can be aggregated together to make it more sensitive. So four or five pieces of disparate information can quickly turn into a sensitive piece of information when put together. Now, uh, most dangerous course of action uh, is that Xenotime actually is able to access a OT environment and uh, pull off another disruptive attack, which we hopefully won't see ever. All right, uh, next slide. All right. Next, we're going to go into uh, Dim Alloy. Dim Alloy is a very persistent threat to the energy sector, to oil and gas, to elect the electric sector. Uh, they are very highly skilled. They really like to put a lot of emphasis on their operations. So. Typically, they will start a long campaign by establishing a series of strategic web compromises. Now, these strategic web compromises will usually be on sites that, from their perspective, the victim is likely to go. Now, a danger to this, or to asset owners, and generally to just users, is that while you may not be targeted, you may accidentally stumble upon one of their watering holes and not know. And these strategic web compromises really focus on harvesting uh, SMB credentials uh, that are uh, embedded in the webs, or the, the tactic is uh, embedded in the uh, compromised website. Now, um, <clears throat> with this, 
as they shift operations around, they, the activity group will largely then move into a operation where they'll begin using spear phishing to uh, gather targets. If not, they will actually attempt to utilize the credentials they've captured to access the targets. Um, next slide. All right. So uh, looking at Dim Al right now, they have their current operations are heavily focused in Ukraine. Their strategic web compromises uh, are focused on the infrastructure in that uh, geographic location. And that's an interesting thing to look at is um, organizations that have a more global footprint uh, can also be collateral victims. Uh, your users may go to these uh, compromised websites unknowingly uh, and not even be a victim, but your the credentials are still being harvested and of use to the actor. They'll be able to see where they came from, the username and uh, the credentials for the SMB. So it, it's basically giving the actor an opportunity that otherwise they wouldn't have. And searching for these uh, can be a little bit difficult but from a defender's perspective, it is a lot easier to find them by looking for the behavior such as, especially with uh, Dim Alloy, uh, doing a, for example, if you have Splunk, doing a search in your web uh, or in your indexes uh, for your proxies or whatnot for, let's say, uh, icon.png, that also had that's uh, in the URL. It's HTTP. It's an IP address followed by icon.png. That is like their go-to method for uh, compromising websites. And when you're searching for it, you're looking for a period of activity where you see this IP address with icon an HTTP request with icon.png as the um, URL followed by an SMB request from your network to that infrastructure. Um, now, this has been largely been successful for them. They've accomplished this attack several times in campaigns in 2017, uh, which was extremely successful. Um, and they still continue to this day. They varied it up here and there, but most often they revert back to that um, icon.png method. Um, <clears throat> now, their strategic outlook, uh, again, they're largely, currently largely, folk, their strategic web compromises and activities are largely focused on Ukraine due to the geopolitical situation. But as they, as the, Ukrainian situation settles, um, they will probably, again, and other geopolitical factors happen, will usually trigger them to move into um, more wide ranging and less uh, regionally focused uh, activities. Now, again, from an operational perspective, um, it's accidentally stumbling into their strategic web compromises uh, that poses the greatest danger uh, to both ICS and uh, IT asset owners, right? And the most likely course of action for them right now is they'll keep establishing their strategic web compromises, building up for campaigns as they gather more and more, while as they gather victims of interest, they will access the network via RDP using the credentials or uh, a variety of other methods. Now, most dangerous course of action right now is them demonstrating the ability to cause a disruptive or destructive event against um, the industries that they have targeted previously. Now, a big differ differentiation between, uh, let's say, Xenotime and Dim Alloy. Dim Alloy has demonstrated the ability to actually get 
into an ICS environment, perform reconnaissance, operate within it, collect intelligence, but they have yet to actually demonstrate the ability to uh, impact or affect ICS operations, as opposed to Xenotime, who has actually demonstrated that with their Trisys framework. Now, if, Dema if it was ever, an attack was ever attributed to Demaloy uh, in performing attack, that would be a large uh, leap in capabilities for them as they have yet to either demonstrate the deployment or haven't felt the need to. Now, uh, next slide. Now, the next one we're going to be going over is Magnolium and recent developments with Iran. Now, we want to focus on this because as tension rise or tensions rise in the Middle East area, especially with Iran as a nexus point for those tensions, we will see a lot of activity from activity groups that align with Iranian interests. And a lot of these can be very reactionary in nature where they're not quite constructed uh, the best. So they can be very noisy campaigns or just um, very widespread campaigns that aren't actually, don't appear initially to be effective, but their purpose isn't really to um, be as laser focused as some of the other activity groups that we observe, especially like Dim Alloy or Xenotime. These are more opportunistic. Um, go to the next slide. <clears throat> so, currently we're tr tracking a large amount of uh, password spraying campaigns from Magnolium. Now, this is within uh, Magnolium's playbook that uh, they kind of just collect a lot of different account information and they just start trying to spray uh, all kinds of organizations with their um, target lists, hoping to get some low hanging fruit. Um, typically in the past, uh, Magnolium, if they are successful in this, well, they will attempt to reach a toehold in the environment and move to capture uh, an active directory to get more legitimate access and to maintain a long, larger persistent access. Now the password spraying uh, is usually gathered from uh, open source intelligence. If they can find uh, emails, they can, they usually just kind of take what they find on the outside in OSINT and just kind of make it more tailored to uh, the organization's uh, domain configuration that they kind of guess at <laughs> to make to be to make it simpler um, now with their um, current activities their strategic outlook um, they are largely focused in the Middle East but as of right now uh, as we're tracking this campaign we have noticed a large pivot towards not only uh, uh, targets in the Middle East, but to many international tr uh, targets uh, for oil and gas sector companies. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, with these tensions uh, that are increasing in Iran, uh, it can be largely viewed as these are reactionary measures by uh, this activity group uh, trying to uh, gather information or possibly set up to perform disruptive operations. Um, as Magnolium shifts uh, into a higher tier um, focus of operations where they're looking to compromise networks, uh, in a more focused manner, they will likely stay within um, the IT 
but the likelihood of them moving to ICS to make a greater impact uh, from their compromise is uh, possible. And again, they haven't really demonstrated the ability to interact with ICS other than perhaps deploying Shamoon or deploying a, um, a destructive wiper or uh, of that nature. All right, uh, next slide. Now, currently there are five threat behaviors we really want to identify. Um, number one is again, SMB credential harvesting. You shouldn't be allowing SMB uh, out of your network. And if you are, you wanna have it highly controlled and focused so that it doesn't uh, go to these strategic web compromises. You shouldn't see it going out over HTTP, uh, and you shouldn't be seeing it uh, going to random addresses that you don't have visibility on. Now, the brute force password spring attempts uh, that Magnolium is conducting aren't unique to Magnolium. Uh, a lot of actors use password spraying. It can be effective uh, if you don't have good password control or two-factor authentication to protect your network. Um, again, they, these actors are very persistent in performing these actions. So, uh, they will just continuously do it until they just find that one piece of low hanging fruit and that's how they get in. Now, uh, three threat behaviors, uh, or the third point in, uh, threat behaviors to identify now, uh, is one that largely, um, is, isn't really monitored by security operation center personnel or even by businesses is the aggregation of non-sensitive information that to the asset owner and pretty much anybody isn't really that important. But these threat actors like to focus on collecting as much information as possible. And when they start putting it together, they can build a larger picture. So even in some areas where you have uh, government regulations or government mandates where you have to put out certain information, that information when put with um, other pieces uh, can lead the actor to identifying how your businesses, business will react to a incident, um, what facilities are located where, how these facilities would react to an incident, um, what personnel are at these facilities, what are points of contact for these facilities. These are all ways that the, these threat actors can gain insight into attacking um, these critical infrastructure environments that from a business perspective aren't dangerous, but for the adversaries, it's gold mine. Now, another one uh, I want to get into is web shells as a pivot point. Um, web shells are common everyday things, but as these actors persist and visibility is lacking in DMZ, in DMZ zones due to either uh, the amount of traffic that comes across them or the amount of... Um, logs that it makes it very difficult to uh, uh, review all the infrastructure. So being able to look for very specific web shells from these actors uh, is a very, very important thing because this is their initial hold. It can also be sometimes their uh, fallback or backup uh, way to access networks is implanting these web shells. And they will utilize these to move from your DMZ into your enterprise and uh, enterprise IT environment, which ultimately will lead them to the OT because there's no such thing as a fully air gap network. Now, it goes without saying, but the unpatched or unmitigated uh, RDP vulnerability that came out recently is also a high priority to focus on due to the ability of it uh, 
being able to be turned into a wormable um, functionality. Um, and with that, Sergio. Yeah, so now we're going to turn it over to, uh, to Ben um, to talk about hunting and response uh, to this activity that's been going on. So just as a recap here, um, you know, Casey presented the current most, uh, you know, current most active uh, threats we've seen affecting critical infrastructure and ICS operators um, surrounding these tensions. And now we want to talk about what should happen, you know, what should we do about it. So with that, over to Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Serge. Uh, yeah, so I won't be too long. Uh, really, I'll, I'm just going to uh, frame, frame the, the situation and then, and then kick over to Mark Stacey to get a little bit more in depth. But uh, to from uh, from my team's perspective, so, so uh, what we just heard from, from Casey and Serge was an uh, intelligence-driven uh, approach of what's going on. Uh, uh, my team is out there uh, doing the, the proactive services as well as the responsive services uh, and, and uh, working with our customers out in the field. Uh, and there's, uh, so you're getting a mix of uh, Intel driven approach and then kind of the practitioner driven approach uh, of how we can pragmatically address this. Uh, and and he, uh, we can kind of divide this into to two large buckets, right? Uh, so the first question, uh, the first common interaction that we would have with the customer is an intrusion very similar to uh, the, the examples that Casey has given on uh, there was an IT intrusion in, inside our, our environment. How, how can we validate it did, did not uh, worm its way down into the, the industrial control systems environment? Uh, and that largely comes down to uh, good security practices and management. Uh, there, there's, no, there's nothing uh, magical about having uh, solid uh, protective controls and visibility into what happens in your industrial environment. Uh, one of the hardest aspects of uh, doing forensics uh, within an industrial environment is that there's just not any data there that uh, is of any relevance to an intrusion. Uh, so being able to pre-position the defense on being able to generate that, that visibility, uh, whether it's through uh, a Jago's platform or just a host collection, a network collection, uh, understanding the, the inventory that you have in the environment, uh, that's, the, that's the first goal. Uh, but the, the other aspect of uh, not only, so the first one being it's a uh, IT intrusion that did it um, uh, gain access into my industrial control environment. The second question is often the flip side. Uh, so we had a disruption within our industrial process. Uh, was it cyber? Uh, so those are the, the two common scenarios uh, that our team faces. Uh, the 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 uh, advantage of the IT intrusion uh, is that we we can uh, quickly ascertain from activity group perspective uh, if that uh, matches Dime Alloy or, or Xeno Time or another activity group, uh, as well as start focusing on the collection points and the data that uh, are. Uh, the uh, delimiters or demark between the IT and OT environment uh, and, and understand what may have been observed and simply what was invisible. Uh, we, we've captured a lot of those concepts into a white paper that we released last year called Collection Management Framework. So that's available on the Dragos website uh, uh, for a free download. Uh, uh, but the Collection Management Framework is about understanding your level of visibility in the environment and, and uh, what are and specifically what are your blind spots as they relate to uh, the activity groups or to the threats that are out there? Uh, so that gives you a good sense of from a pragmatic and preparatory standpoint of would I even have visibility to detect something moving laterally from the IT environment into the OT environment and, and stationed there, whether it's a web shell or some other component. On the on the disruption side, it's more of uh, uh, after after the, the the actual impact of was there was there an attack that I simply wasn't aware of uh, uh, so taking a more consequence driven approach uh, and, and so there's an, a white paper that we released I think two weeks ago on uh, consequence driven analysis uh, and how to pursue that uh, so instead of a intelligence driven approach it's more of a expertise driven approach of 
uh, if there's a specific outcome within a facility, what, what systems would be attacked by the adversary in order to have a particular impact? Essentially, it is talking to the engineering, the instrumentation people within your facilities to understand what the worst day uh, for them and their facility would look like, and then uh, turn and then adding in that flavor of if that attack were to happen, what do we overlay on top of that to see the visibility? Uh, so from a, a, a collection management framework of understanding the level of visibility you have in your environment and then tuning that to the, the most uh, critical, uh, uh, sometimes crown jewels uh, uh, approach uh, or assets in your environment, that gives you essentially a threat model to understand your most critical assets and how well they're protected and how well you have visibility on that uh, to do uh, be able to identify when there is a breach uh, uh, before there's uh, there's an actual impact. So with that, uh, I'm going to I'll flip it over to to Mark to to go through the the hunting and and some of the the more uh, proactive steps uh, that we've seen over the the last year as well. Um, um, and so, uh, Mark, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, if we thank you, Sergio. Uh, so we really kind of think about three core questions, and they're not too sophisticated. They're actually fairly straightforward. I imagine they're all things that we've all considered. Uh, we just, I think it's worth talking about some specifics that we could be doing to better enhance the capability across all three. Uh, the first, what is on my network? Through 2018, uh, more than half of our engagements were focused on answering this question for our clients in some capacity. Uh, just identifying what does the network look like. Uh, a lot of the initial requests that we get is tell me if I'm under attack. Tell me if an adversary is on my network now. And a lot of times we have to roll back and first address the question on, or rather, what is the network consist of? Uh, critical assets, having a baseline inventory of what vendors and what the architecture looks like uh, over time, hopefully maturing that to getting towards a CMF or that collection management framework that the Ben referenced and having more detailed inventory of what logs are available to facilitate triage. But just starting with that base level, uh, what does the network look like? Through all of our engagements thus far, uh, it's a fraction of a percent that has had a detailed network diagram with IP mapping across the subnets and detailed inventory, uh, clients that have had that ready for us when we land on site, like I said, has been a, a very small fraction. A lot of times during uh, initial interviews, we'll ask, what are the critical assets on the network? And a lot of people can think about it and have conversations amongst the team and come up with a good answer. Uh, the problem is that each person needs to have that answer readily available. It's used as part of the escalation process during triage or incident response. So some of the base fundamental questions on uh, the network is a good place to start. So I think uh, an action item leaving here is really just uh, starting to look at what is on the network. And part of that requires visibility, uh, looking at your change control process. So when a change does take place, is that being captured somewhere? Digging up your network diagrams and then looking at uh, what is on the network to see whether or not they're, they're updated and just doing some of the base level hygiene information, I think is one of the, the initial steps and one of the, the greatest return on investments that anyone could do when they start to focus on the, uh, the cybersecurity. Uh, so the next question that we get, is my network under attack? Again, a lot of clients start with this question it's kind of on the tip of everyone's tongue, it's what they're interested about, and we can't really properly address it until we have an understanding of what is on the network. Uh, not to say that all of these questions need to be worked in a linear fashion, they can be uh, pursued in parallel, uh, but understanding what is on the network will provide context so I can then answer, is it under attack? Uh, what is odd behavior? What is anomalous? What is malicious versus benign. Uh, a lot of times, uh, as, as I'm sure everyone on the call uh, understands now that 
an attack uh, similar to, say, crash override, flipping a simple bit. Without that context, you're looking at a bit being flipped multiple times, hundreds or thousands of times a day, a valve being open and shut up a certain percentage throughout normal operation. When is one malicious and one is not? In order to answer that, you really need the understanding, that context about the network first. And as Sergio and, and Casey and Ben have all stated, we also need visibility. Uh, this is for proactive as well as responsive. A lot of times we get called in to do incident response and the client has no log retention. There's no uh, network monitoring or host uh, log aggregation point. And so it's more a return to service rather than a root cause analysis. We're limited on what we can get if the data is not there. Uh, when we talk about visibility, a lot of people uh, ask a question on focusing on host or network. And certainly in the ICS space, I think network makes more sense. We can sit passively, uh, which makes introduction into these networks practical. We're not deploying any software in line. We're not pushing something out to a host. Uh, so passive network monitoring is uh, practical for getting into the environments. Additionally, uh, it, it's more uh, bang for your buck considering level of effort. If I set up a span port or a tap in a strategic location, I can see multiple different hosts and I can see what is active on the network rather than what may just be sitting benign. So network monitoring, uh, proactive hunting, that kind of leads to vulnerability detection, and actionable to take away from this. Uh, I think maybe a good way to start tipping your toe into uh, a proactive threat hunting, it's kind of a buzzword in the industry now, one way to get into it is to set up a span port on one of your core switches. Do a PCAP capture for an hour or a day, and have analysts look at that uh, over, over that same time period. So uh, maybe Friday capture it for an hour and the next week have people investigate it until they can describe everything that's taking place in the PCAP. It will be a learning experience. There is a learning curve for everyone involved. But as you work through that process, again, you start to answer that initial question of what is on my network. Your analysts are going to learn protocol analysis, they're going to get a better idea of the context on the network. So over time, they can uh, identify better security controls or better configurations, and from those identify malicious activity. Uh, another maybe quick note on, on the proactive threat hunting side, uh, one is gathering visibility and looking without a target. Uh, another thing I think is, is interesting or a useful exercise is basing it on the adversary behaviors. Uh, Casey mentioned web shells before. Uh, looking for web shells can be very difficult. Uh, it could be a single line on a web page, it could be a complete web page, or some embedded code that doesn't show up. So thinking about uh, web shell detection on a network, what are some methodologies you can use to identify that? When it could be as small as a, a few bytes existing in the web page. Uh, so thinking through some of those exercises is another uh, very beneficial threat hunting exercise. The last uh, question is, how do I respond? Once I believe there is uh, malicious intent or a malicious actor on my network, uh, how do I react? And to Sergio's point, uh, going in without a tested plan is very costly for the organization. We do a lot of tabletops for clients and a lot of our incident response retainers and rapid response that we go out uh, follows the same workflow where there's a very robust incident response plan. It's been drafted, reviewed, uh, legal is signed off and everyone has approved it from a top management level. The problem is I was never communicated down to the analysts doing the work. And what is on paper may not be practical to the skill set or the capabilities within the organization. This comes up very frequently during tabletop exercises where uh, something in the IRP may be investigate root cause analysis. And uh, picking one example, one tabletop we did, we uh, pushed a, or generated the scenario of pushing a malform config file to a compressor. When the compressor rebooted, uh, the malform config file prevented it from coming back up. And so the IRP specified, well, go identify the uh, 
footprint on the network, so go check the other compressors. It turns out that no one in the organization directly had the training or the skill set to go interact with these devices while they're in production, while they're in operation, to pull out the config file. They didn't have the knowledge to tell whether or not the config file was sound. And so what was in the guidance, what management thought was a good preparation, didn't really translate down to action. And that's where I think testing and going through the exercises is very important. Uh, professional relationships inside and outside of your organization are also very important. We do a lot of engagements where uh, say in the electric utility transmission network team will come in, generation network team will come in, and they'll introduce themselves to each other while we're sitting in the room. Good that it's taking place then, unfortunate that it, it hadn't taken place until then. And then uh, leveraging the business continuity plan, uh, if one exists, and, and kind of leveraging that as part of the incident response process is also very valuable. Uh, where we're talking about uh, the current threat for uh, this presentation and a lot of the uh, media that's come out has mentioned uh, wipers. One thing about wipers and ransomware, once you are alerted, uh, generally it's too late. The action has been done. And so thinking through the incident response, it may not all be analysis. It may be pivoting over to uh, sustainability of the service. And working through some of those exercises is very valuable as well. Uh, and then just kind of, again, talking through the, the thought process, uh, they can be worked in parallel. And generally, we're going to uh, use these to feed back up and, and enhance the previous one. So is my network under attack? In getting visibility and doing proactive threat hunting, uh, we're going to see what is on my network. We're going to get a better understanding of that. When I respond to threats or compromise, well, I'm going to leverage that visibility. I need to know what the threat actor is doing on my network so I can investigate the TTPs. And I have to have an understanding of what is on my network in regards to security controls that offer visibility. And so it's a very, uh, I would say recursive process and uh, kind of a vicious cycle that improves upon itself uh, throughout the, the go. So uh, Sergio went right up to the bottom of the hour, but I will toss it back over to you, sir. Awesome, thank you very much, Mark, um, Ben, and Casey. So that's gonna conclude our presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, in the uh, chat um, or the Q&A part of the webinar here. Uh, we are actually going to do a offline address uh, of, of those. So um, if you ask a question, we will address it uh, in a written post. Um, uh, again, following up, um, the technical indicators aren't going to be available, but they are being distributed uh, appropriately across uh, various industries and sectors. And then this presentation has been recorded and will be, uh, will be available online later. Um, so if uh, you want to share it with others, you want to rewatch it um, because, you know, you think Casey said something awesome um, and, you know, you definitely want to go back and uh, check it out, um, then we uh, encourage you to do so. Uh, and of course, always hit us up, uh, intel at dragos.com. It's an easy way to get a hold of us anytime, anywhere. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we do try to help uh, the community whenever we possibly can. Um, that's why we do this. So, uh, you know, guys, everyone out there, stay safe. Uh, do your best. Uh, we all know you're working your ass off. Um, it's hard being a, uh, a defender out there. Um, you know, but we're going to do everything we can to help you. So uh, anyway, thank you all so much for your time. And I'll leave the question Q&A open here for just a few minutes and you can go ahead and drop them in there. And then like I said, we will actually answer those questions uh, offline in a blog post very, very shortly. So thank you so much for your time. Have a great day, everybody.